fired at this, it's okay. All right. All right. All right, everybody, come on up. Don't worry about the breeze here. It's appropriate. It's always a bad hair day on the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal. So, um, welcome. Welcome. I know we had a little bit of a glacial start getting all the way over there, but it's great to see everyone uh, here at the what will be soon the birthplace of the American offshore wind industry. Uh, others, uh, yes. So, yeah, I know there are a total of seven turbines already spinning in U.S. waters, but this will be the launching pad of America's first industrial scale offshore wind project, the first real power plant uh, in U.S. waters. And um, so it is an auspicious time. We are uh, all of about T minus six weeks, seven weeks away from the first components uh, to arrive here. And it's been an effort in the making for uh, the better part of the last decade, if not, not more. Um, and for those of us, uh, like our governor, and so many folks who are here, Amanda Lefton, uh, recently uh, uh, having left the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, some of the folks behind me, so many of you, uh, it's a really exciting time. Uh, we, the offshore wind industry is a, uh, uh, a, an industry that's matured for the last 30 years in Europe, as so many of you know, including especially those of you who've been involved in it. And it, it is finally arriving on the shores of the United States, and it's arriving right here in New Bedford. Um, I, over the years, um, in her capacity as Attorney General, now Governor, Maura Healy uh, has had a number of conversations with those of us in New Bedford. She's always been such a stalwart supporter. Uh, and it is um, no surprise that just as in general, she and Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll have come flying out of the blocks uh, in, in their first not even 60, roughly 60-plus 60, 60 days uh, in office now. And if you look at uh, administrations at every level of government, uh, it's just from a historic perspective, right? President, governor, mayor, uh, take your pick. Uh, one thing that they all have in common is that they get out of the gate fast. They start fast. They execute on the things they promised to do once in office. And we stand here today just a couple of months into it, and one thing is just so clear and that is that this new administration has done, is already doing what it said it would do. It, it is executing on its priorities. It's making things happen already, and that, frankly, excites me. We have to take a look at the budget and the priorities that are in the budget. We'll talk in a little more detail about that in a moment. Uh, it's a budget that reflects the state's priorities about, around housing, uh, around, uh, around equity and justice communities, around economic competition, um, and around uh, a fair tax code. Uh, these are all, and many, many more, uh, by the way. Uh, these are all things that uh, candidate Healy said she would do, and she is doing them now. And so it really bodes well for establishing a, a foundation of goodwill for the rest of your administration to come. Um, I, I know I could talk about the tea. We're unfamiliar with the tea in New Bedford, but just, we're just getting it in a, later this year. It's all foreign to us. Uh, but, we, but these are things that uh, she and, and, and her and running for office said that she would solve problems, she would tackle the big issues, she wouldn't shy away from them. And as someone who's known her for a long time, I can tell you that's just the way she is, and that's what you can expect, and that's what, that's what she's doing. So we're so proud of uh, the start. We're really excited about the start uh, thus far, and we know that it just bodes so well for what's to come. What we're talking about today is – the big challenge of our time. Uh, and I don't need to preach about the challenges of climate change uh, to anybody here. Uh, it's an, in a way, it's an exercise in, in preaching to the choir. But we do know that at once we, we have to deal with, with climate. Massachusetts has to continue to be not just a leader, but actually really get out ahead, really set the tone for the entire country. But while we also 
compete economically, and that's especially true in offshore wind. So it's about climate and competition. They're not mutually exclusive. We can deal with climate change and be a leader nationally uh, as a state, but we also know that we can also attract capital here in this, this industry that has a whole lot of money to invest. We want this industry to invest here in New Bedford, and we've got a, uh, a governor who is, uh, if nothing else, an intense competitor, and I mean that in the most flattering way. It is one of your strongest attributes, and that's what uh, this governor uh, and lieutenant governor alike, both of them are making happen. And so I, I just want to say, um, and I don't want to steal anybody's thunder about the announcements today about the CEC, but I, I do want to say that under Jen D'Aloisio's leadership, the CEC is really on the right track. I know Bruce Carlisle's here today, who's headed up the offshore wind efforts for the CEC for a number of years now, but both of them are focused on all the right things. And uh, it has been a pleasure working with them. And the fact that uh, the governor is investing mightily in the CEC will make a big difference here in New Bedford, and, and, uh, and it will make a big difference. Your investments in climate generally will make a big difference here. And so um, we're really excited about uh, the tone you've set, uh, the budget priorities you have established, uh, and your overall outlook. And um, we're just so excited, Governor, uh, to get working uh, with you. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the governor of Massachusetts, Maura Healy. Oh. oh, well, thank you so much, Mayor Mitchell, and um, thank you for pointing out I was going to have a crazy hair day, so uh, you're absolutely right. But the wind's blowing. That's a great thing, right? That's what we want. Um, we are just so excited to be here today. I know that you know, as the lieutenant governor and I were making our way uh, down here to the south coast and New Bedford specifically, we're just really happy, really happy to see all of you, really happy to visit once again all that's happening down here and to, to see all the incredible progress that's been made. We're so happy to have our team with us, um, including our Energy and Environmental Affairs Secretary, Rebecca Tepper, um, and of course, uh, to have Mass CEC CEO Jen Delosio uh, here as well, and her her great team. Um, also, I, I do want to just commend the the work of of all electeds. Um, Mayor Mitchell has been an incredible an incredible leader for New Bedford on so so many fronts, and I've had the privilege of working alongside him and spending time up close over the last eight, nine years now, and albeit, you know, now in a new capacity, um, I know that uh, there, there's no mayor more committed to, to uh, improving the lives and economic opportunity for residents and businesses uh, than Mayor Mitchell. And so it's always awesome to be able to come and partner with him and, uh, and stand with him today uh, supporting an industry that he has long championed. Uh, mayor Mitchell understood a long time ago the imperative of addressing what was happening with our climate and also recognizing the huge economic opportunity it is for our state. And so the competitor that he is, uh, and he is a competitor, um, his efforts have been tireless and his team's efforts have been tireless and really, and really driving this. And so it's great to be with you, Mayor, uh, and I thank you for your leadership. And of course, there are so many who are so supportive and working hard day in and day out. Uh, we have Councilor, Councilors Lima and uh, Murad and Carney with us here today. Uh, we also have our, our good friends in the legislature, Representative Schmid, uh, Representative Hendricks, Representative Markey, Representative Cabral. Um, again, working so hard on behalf of, of folks in, in, this, in this area, but really statewide on so, so many fronts. And we're delighted to, to stand with you all. Um, and delighted to, to be here at the Marine Commerce Terminal, uh, surrounded by not only folks in government and, uh, and our agencies, but importantly, the workers. You guys are out there making it happen, and it is so exciting. I was just getting schooled on, on these cranes that are going to be up. We're going we're gonna to bring in Patriots Day. I think that's the day, right? April 17th? That's when, that's, that's awesome, right? 
Um, hearing about all that's happened, it's super, super exciting and a huge credit to, to all the teams for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say something about Mass CEC. We're really, really proud of the Clean Energy Center. And it's true. I said uh, when I ran that our administration would look to triple the budget of Mass CEC. And for those of you who don't know, um, Mass CEC, it's, it's really an organization that we are so excited about. It's a dynamic and critical component of our strategy to tackle the climate crisis and to grow our economy in the process. They do tremendous work supporting our clean tech entrepreneurs, uh, supporting job training, electrifying our buildings, and uh, as well, they own this incredible terminal here, um, as well as other important assets around the state. But um, I am just so uh, proud as governor to be here in the spot, New Bedford, historic New Bedford, once the epicenter of whaling, um, to this day America's number one fishing port, um, to, to celebrate the fact that this is the first United States port facility designed for the offshore wind industry. How awesome is that? New Bedford made history with the construction of the Marine Commerce Terminal and will make history once again when New Bedford and Massachusetts becomes the global capital of the offshore wind industry. And the, your Lieutenant Governor and I are committed to seeing that through, working with all of you. We know this won't happen overnight, though everybody is hustling and working very hard. It does take time. Um, the vision we have will take all of us there, working hand in hand to train the workers to invest in this vital infrastructure, to one day power our lives with wind energy and become a world leader in offshore wind technology. That's what our budget seeks to do. Uh, it's one of the reasons we're here today. Included in the first installment in our pledge to triple funding for the Mass Clean Energy Center is a proposal of $35 million. That includes $21 million to facilitate some of our partnerships with public higher ed institutions and the trades to increase the amount of training, retraining, and the opportunities, the great opportunities to work in this vibrant and growing clean energy industry, including with the likes of all of you here at the Marine Commerce Terminal. Combined with additional funding we're seeking in a supplemental budget, Mass CEC will see its budget triple from what it was last year. This boost will help them support even more projects like this one and take existing projects to new heights. We're committed to supporting Mass CEC, to supporting the industry, to supporting residents of New Bedford and the South Coast. And these are exactly the kinds of projects, this is exactly the kind of initiative we're talking about when I talk about building a climate corridor, a climate corridor that, by the way, can stretch from New North Adams all the way to New Bedford and everywhere in between, harnessing innovation, technology, research, manufacturing. Because while the climate crisis is our greatest threat, there's also a tremendous opportunity for Massachusetts, an opportunity to grow jobs, to grow economic opportunity, to do right by what we need to do to address the real needs when it comes to climate and to make sure that Massachusetts is the global leader in the transition to a clean energy economy. That's why we're making our investments, that's why we're here today, uh, and that's why you see this commitment. Also, for the first time ever in our state's history, uh, the Lieutenant Governor and I have proposed a budget that makes sure that we are dedicating 1%, 1% of the total state budget to the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. It's so, so important. This will be a major boost that will be transformative. We also have working with us the nation's first climate chief and Melissa Hoffer, who is making sure that across every realm of government, we are driving a strong agenda. Look, in our budgeting, we are looking to match our ambitions with our investments. Uh, we don't just talk a big game, we want to deliver and execute, and I know together working with the likes of all of our colleagues in government and all of you, we're going to see that through, and we're super, super excited about that. Um, and speaking of someone who brings tremendous ambition and capacity and, and vision uh, is our great Lieutenant Governor, uh, Kim Driscoll, who will speak to us now. What a great day to be in New Bedford. I'm a little partial to historic coastal communities, 
Uh, and it's terrific to be here with, uh, with Mayor Mitchell, who's been a real leader in this offshore wind industry, making sure we think about the investments we need to make as a state to help partner with our cities, particularly our gateway cities, who shoulder so much of the work and the heft and the opportunity in our Commonwealth. Um, and so as a former mayor of another coastal gateway city, I should have known it was going to be colder than I planned for, because it's, it's never not cold on the water. But what a view, and what a great day to be here. The sun is shining, uh, not just uh, on this community, but frankly on this industry. Um, and as the governor just mentioned, like what a, a great partner to have in, in the work that I'm doing, but what a great partner for our communities. Um, we intend to, as, as was mentioned, increase funding for the Mass CEC, as the governor just detailed. And last week, um, I had the good fortune to be in Beverly, seeing some of the CEC-funded work there on electric school buses and training for STEM teachers to incorporate electrical vehicle education in their curriculum. So when we think about a clean energy corridor and what it can mean for Massachusetts, it really covers a lot of ground. Not only is this having a positive impact on school districts' carbon footprint in Beverly and, and other places, but we're also teaching kids at a young age the importance of clean energy and how they can make decisions in their everyday lives that can make a difference in the fight against climate change. There were a whole lot of fifth and sixth graders who were excited to show us their electric school bus depot and their electric school bus uh, maintenance facility and the work that they're doing when they're on the bus to think about how they're using electricity. And again, just another example of the importance of Mass CEC. It's really an organization at the nexus of our clean energy strategy, and, it's need, and it needs to support uh, this work at scale and how we can do that collaboratively. And like the governor said, we're proposing 1% of the state's budget go to the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. That's a lot of money when you're talking about a 50 plus billion dollar budget. And there's a lot that we can do, and I thought I'd just share with you a snapshot of what are that, some of that funding is going to do this year, we hope, in our proposed budget. There's $70 million to benefit environmental justice communities, including creating the Environmental Justice Office and hiring liaisons who are dedicated to ensuring that communities bearing a disproportionate burden from climate change will be centered in our policymaking. As the home to a coal-fired power plant in the city of Salem came to us in 1950, we we're probably happy to have it. To see that site converted into a space for offshore wind marshalling, making sure that the environmental justice communities impacted by that coal-fired power plant are now reaping some of the benefits. Really critical. We want to be intentional upon that. And that's what this environmental justice office is going to do. $40 million towards the Clean Energy and Climate Plan to help us reach our net zero emissions by 2050. You've got to have a plan, and you've got to work that plan, and it takes resources to do that. $25 million for our food and security grants, FSIG grants, I should say, food security infrastructure grants. The rep and I were just talking about this, how small dollars can go a long way. We made that permanent. That's going to benefit our fishing and aqu aquaculture industries through the purchase of equipment, food safety upgrades, and modernizing fleets. That's a real connection point and something that can be a big lift in so many communities. Uh, Five million for climate resiliency efforts to prevent and protect against droughts, coastal erosion and, erosion and flooding, something we know that's impacting uh, not only our coastal communities, but frankly, the work we're doing on farms, neighborhoods where people are living, important work that we need to make sure we're planning for and investing in. No community can take that on, on their, by themselves. And of course, we're lucky to have, as the governor mentioned, first in the nation, Climate Chief Melissa Hoffer, coordinating our climate efforts across all aspects of government because we know that the climate crisis impacts all aspects of our lives. Education, transportation, workforce, health care and more. It's important that we have somebody quarterbacking that effort here in the state and we're proud to have Melissa as part of that team. Together we can make progress. We need on climate we can make the progress we need on climate goals and make Massachusetts a global leader in clean energy. That is not idle chit chat. That is the plan. That is the action that we are taking to support that effort. We can build a healthier, greener, more equitable future that all of our kids deserve. Someday our grandkids are going to ask us, what did we do to fight climate change? And these are the sorts of answers we're going to point to. And I'm happy uh, to turn it over to the woman who will be leading most of the work with an incredible team, that 1% of the budget, most of which is going to be under her roof, our Environmental and Affairs Secretary, Rebecca Tepper. So how about our governor and lieutenant governor? Walk in the walk. You've never had a better boss than these two. It's, um, it's been a real privilege 
to uh, start this new job, and I'm excited to see you all here, and thanks for having us uh, today. Um, you know, a special thanks to uh, Mayor Mitchell, who uh, I've known for a long time, and he has been an ally and a partner uh, and a real leader on the offshore wind industry, and we're just privileged to work with him and um, see this area grow. You know, I was here, I don't know, probably eight years ago, and um, there wasn't this, there wasn't all this stuff here. Um, and, you know, it's really grown quite a bit, and I'm uh, looking forward to seeing it grow more and this really being a epicenter of the offshore wind industry here in the, in the United States. I think people have um, call, called attention, both the Attorney General, uh, both, both the Governor and the Lieutenant Governor uh, talked about the funding for the um, EEA agencies. And, you know, for many years people have talked about those agencies being underfunded. Um, and this is the first time that 1% of the budget is being dedicated to the EEA agencies, and it's going to make a, a very large difference. Um, part of that money is going to be invested in uh, environmental justice. Um, we're going to make sure that every agency has uh, people, uh, both people who are outwardly facing and inwardly, inwardly facing to um, make sure that all of our decisions are have our environmental justice at the center and that the people who um, have the right, uh, right people at the table making sure everybody is there. So, you know, it's really a historic proposal in terms of the money and, you know, we're going to use it to electrify our buildings and transportation. <clears throat> to support our clean technology companies and keep them here um, so that they can uh, bring sustainable jobs and uh, train workers to take on those jobs. And finally, we're also going to make sure that cities and towns are involved in all of the decision making that we're doing because it's so important to make sure that we have cooperation and have um, the people who are really down on the ground doing the work, um, helping making the decisions. So, you know, as everybody has already said, you know, we're, we are in a race in time um, to slow down the impacts of, of the changing climate and to strengthen our resiliency and build new clean energy resources and transmission. And as everybody has talked about the governor being competitive, it is true. Um, and she's, you know, not going to settle for just being um, a national leader in offshore wind. We're going to want to have people coming here and learning from here and bringing their businesses here and their manufacturing facilities. And we want to be, in, we want the innovators here. And we want them to learn from our, our workers and companies. And the ripple effect of these investments um, can be profound. Um, in my mind, we really cannot afford not to do this work. Um, many of our residents along the coastline know all too well that the climate crisis is here. You know, erosion, warming oceans, extreme heat, that ridiculous amount of snow that we got in Western Mass this, um, this week. Um, you know, these are real threats to our communities. Um, but as we have all said and will say again, it's an opportunity for our state to make a difference and to make a difference for our children and to make a difference in people's lives by building good jobs and manufacturing facilities and opportunities for new development. You know, as you can see here, you know, we have um, lucky to have local leaders and state lawmakers and our governor and lieutenant governor and business leaders all united in seizing this opportunity together. I'm super excited about seeing our first offshore uh, industrial offshore wind farm uh, opening up soon, and we're going to be really looking forward to um, seeing those big blades here. Um, so they were at the testing center, and um, they had to like cut them off a little bit because they were so big they couldn't fit in the um, fit in the space. Which, by the way, we're going to change, going to build a bigger place. Um, we hope and hope to have all your support on that. Um, so we, you know, we can't do this um, without your partnership and um, really appreciate you all coming out and uh, really excited to get to work. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing the head of, of the Mass Clean Energy Center, Jen Del Delosio. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled to welcome you to Mass CEC's New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal. 
Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary Tepper, and state and local officials, we are honored by your collective commitment to addressing climate change, and we at MassEC are proud to play a role in the Commonwealth's clean energy leadership. MassEC was created in 2009, and one of the very first things that we did was undertake an offshore wind port and infrastructure assessment. With that bold and future-focused leadership, we have laid the foundation for the U.S. offshore wind industry right here in Massachusetts. We broke ground on this facility in 2013, and it was completed in 2015. And as the governor said, today this stands as the only U.S. port purpose-built to support the offshore wind industry, an example that many states are hurrying to follow. Mass CEC was created to make progress on our most challenging, hardest to solve climate problems. Since its inception, Mass CEC has been a catalyst in the clean energy transition. We were the first in the state to fund pilots for clean transportation options like e-bikes and the electric school buses the Lieutenant Governor talked about. We were the first to fund incentives for building electrification, including solar, air source heat pumps, and energy storage. And we continue to iterate on these programs, ensuring that all residents are included as we transition to our clean energy solutions. We've established workforce programming that reduces barriers to employment and increases opportunities for well-paying jobs. And I share with you this history because it's important to know how Massachusetts became a nation leader in clean energy and how these strategic investments continue to build a robust market for clean energy here in Massachusetts. It's because of this leadership pursuing a vision of sustainable, clean energy future that we're here today. And our future is indeed exciting. We're here at the start of an industry with the first commercial scale offshore wind project in the country happening right here at this facility. It's so exciting to be here today to see the cranes for many of us that have been here and, and wishing for the day and hoping for the day to see the activity really come. And Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll's budget proposal is a remarkable level of commitment, making Massachusetts a global leader in clean energy and climate solutions. Growth in offshore wind and many clean energy solutions and workforce programs will be propelled by the Healy Driscoll administration's budget proposal. For the first time ever, funding for Mass CEC is included in the governor's operating budget with plans that the governor talked about to triple our funding. That represents a historic level of investment in Mass CEC that will create many more firsts with a focus on creating well-paying jobs that are equitable and accessible to all of our residents. The funds in this budget ensure that Mass CEC can launch and maintain longer-term programs that can significantly scale up solutions. This budget inclusion shows immense confidence in our programming and our gratitude is matched by our excitement to ramp up our work and deliver for Massachusetts. I see a lot of our partners in labor and the clean energy industry here today and from our investments in clean energy internships to offshore wind workforce and minority and women business enterprise support to workforce equity awards, Mass EC has devoted over $40 million to build a clean energy workforce, working towards reducing those barriers to work so that no one is left behind in this clean energy transition. Massachusetts has ambitious climate goals to hit by 2030 and 2050, and we must significantly grow that workforce to meet those goals. With increased funding from this budget, we can expand our workforce programming to ensure that Massachusetts is on track and does so equitably and inclusively. The new workforce will build a decarbonized future in Massachusetts. It will build and upgrade our homes and buildings. Mass CEC is really proud of our building decarbonization work. We've seen successful pilots of this work. We were the first to fund over 540 affordable housing units to be built to passive house standards, the most efficient building standard in the world. This initial work proved that you could do so at an incremental, very small incremental cost. And today there are more than 10,000 units in the pipeline to be built to passive house standards. A great example of the catalytic power of Mass EC's efforts. It's not just new buildings. We are focused on triple deckers and retrofitting existing buildings so that we can learn lessons and provide pathways for every clean energy building of the future. The governor's budget proposal will also help bring clean transportation work to more residents. Here in Massachusetts, we have some pretty ambitious goals. The support of this budget means that we can significantly ramp up our programming 
to increase the pace of innovation, the scale up of deployment of commercially ready technologies while leveraging private investment, growing the clean energy sector, and creating well-trained, well-paid workforce. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and Secretary Tepper for allowing us to showcase our work and our facility here today and for giving Mass CEC this enormous vote of confidence. We're so grateful for your support and we really can't wait to get to work. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us here today. At this time, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Great. <clears throat> questions or should we come over here? I know everybody's ear is cold, right? It's cold. <laughs> it's cold, but it's good. All right, all right. We'll get, all right. Any questions? Yeah. Sure, I'm gonna let Jen answer that question. Thank you for the question. So Vineyard Wind is currently using this facility and they'll be building the first commercial scale offshore wind project off the coast of, of Massachusetts. And the second facility is Mayflower, now called South Coast Wind. They will be leasing this terminal facility uh, after that. <clears throat> this, this is why I'm all in on climate. This is why I talk about it as a huge opportunity for our state. Not only is it essential to meeting what we need to meet in this moment when it comes to climate and, and all the changes and the havoc that it's wreaking, but it's a huge jobs opportunity. And there's jobs that really run the gamut. The jobs that we see today where people are working and building and constructing. Um, and then there's going to be just ongoing jobs with work that is going to be done. It is super exciting. And that is why I can confidently say that Massachusetts is poised to be the global leader for offshore wind. And also we have the opportunity as a whole state to embrace this industry and grow great jobs through manufacturing, innovation, research, technology. And it's why the Lieutenant Governor and I made the investments that we are proposing be made in our budget. We're really, really excited. This is super important. And I do want to thank all the workers and the companies. Um, the way this was done, uh, it's super important and it's a template for the great kind of, uh, of, of effort we can see going forward. I think what's important is that we have a process that is competitive and that does everything we can to get things online. And, you know, there are a lot of factors we'll consider. Uh, experience uh, is certainly something that we'll consider, but there are a number of factors to be considered. The important thing is that we move along uh, with these processes so that we're able to bring wind here as quickly as possible. Okay. You know, I think we are. Um, remember, it was just a few days after we took office that we were here on the, in the South Coast. We were at UMass Dartmouth, an example of uh, many of uh, the, the kinds of partnerships that we have and can have in this state when it comes to investing in educational opportunities. Yes, through our vocational schools, also through other uh, educational institutions. This is a huge, huge opportunity for us as a state. Uh, that includes investments I noted earlier, $21 million that will be used to, to fund investments in education, training, and, and the like. So we're really excited. Um, and there's no better region, really, when you – and there are great regions all over the state where we're going to be doing this and looking to make these investments. <clears throat> well, I, I'm here in New Bedford, and I can't say enough great things about New Bedford. Not only the, the offshore wind technology, it's incredible, it's super cool all that's going on, but also the marine science technology, right? So this is, a, this is a gem, this is a resource that not only is gonna help power this state, it's gonna help power our country in meeting our move to renewables. And it's super exciting and it's something that the residents of the South Coast and New Bedford should be very proud of and I'm grateful for. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Anything else will come over there.